start a set of lectures by Professor Tim Eichler from the University of Arizona. And Tim is an expert in um, statistical analysis of data, weak lensing, everything. And so now we're going to get really observational because he's going to talk <laughs> about how to get from models to data and back, maybe. <laughs> or the other way around. Or we'll we'll around. see, yeah. <laughs> so, Tim, take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for, for having me. I'm still new to this professor thing, and the expert thing also doesn't sound, <laughs> sound totally right, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions to try and get everybody engaged. So it would be very nice if you had um, a, a piece of paper on which you can write answers, um, and then actually we'll play the game that you will exchange the sheets of paper, and then somebody else is going to read an answer. Uh, that's going to happen later on. Uh, but I want to prepare you. So does everybody here have pen and paper? Uh, who, who does not have pen and paper? Sorry. OK. Wait, Vivian, come on. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, please somebody uh, share pen and paper with, uh, with Vivian. Pen. Um, all right, so from models to data, I, I quickly wanted to say something about me. Um, just that you know what, what questions you can ask me in case you're interested in this, thing, in this stuff. Um, so very, very quick bio. I got my uh, diploma in, in, in Germany, actually, then I moved to the US in 2009. During my PhD, I was not really involved in data. I was sitting in offices next to people who were doing a lot of data analysis, who were reducing raw data, raw images into catalogs. Um, that was not what I did. I was um, mostly building code to predict observables. Um, but I was rather doing that more or less uh, by myself with, uh, with, the, with the, my supervisor, Peter Schneider, and with uh, Martin Kilbinger, who is uh, now at Saclay, I think. Um, and then I moved to um, The Ohio State University. I was a postdoc there for about two and a half years. That's where I got really deeply involved in the Dark Energy Survey. It was 2009. Dark Energy Survey did not yet have data, but it was promised to me, and it was very clear that it would have data and that the data would be good. And so some of these lectures uh, later this week are going to be on, on the DES data analysis because I'm still involved in DES. Um, then I moved to the University of Pennsylvania. Very nice picture of Philly. This is the massive Wharton School, which is known for finances. Um, and the physics department is exactly the opposite of that. It is a very small, old, and uh, the AC is not working building. So, it's, yeah. Um, that's where I also got involved in LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. So that's kind of a successor mission of DES. It's going to be deeper. It's going to be wider. It's going to be better in very many different aspects. The data analysis is going to be more challenging and more complicated. And so... Being involved now in DES is an ideal preparation for later working on LSST. Um, then, okay, there was, I, I got an offer from, from NASA to be a staff scientist there. That's very hard to reject, so I took that offer. Um, but it is a very different uh, change of environment when you go from a, a university to a national lab to a NASA lab. That's, that's very different. But it was a permanent position, so no brainer, took it. Um, that's where I got involved in WFIRST and SPHEREX. So those are, because NASA is space, it's a, a space mission. It's very difficult to continue on ground-based surveys when you are working at a NASA lab, I can tell you that. That's something somebody should have told me before. Um, w first space mission that is going to launch in 2025. Um, SPHEREX is a smaller scope all-sky survey. It's not going to be as deep, but it's an infrared all-sky survey in 100 different bands um, going to launch in 2023. And um, yeah, just very recently, so since August uh, 2018, I then moved to the um, University of Arizona in beautiful Tucson, which is surrounded by mountains and deserts, and this is the green oasis uh, of science, as I, as I tend to call it. Okay, so lecture content. Um, this is a quick overview about the lectures uh, of this week that I'm about to give. Um, it, is, uh, it might change, uh, depending on... Uh, how I feel t tonight or tomorrow. So, and also, if you have, uh, if you have, if you want it to change in some shape or form, if you're interested in, in a certain topic, just talk to me after this lecture, and I will try to build it into the next. Um, today, we're going to cover overview concepts of data analysis with cosmological surveys, and this is going to be very, very uh, shallow. I'm going to say shallow. So, it's going to be just an overview, just the concepts. It's an abstract level. There is not going to be a deep dive in any one of these topics. 
But what I would like you to understand at the end of this week is how a multi-probe analysis in a cosmological survey is actually done. And that is very complex. And so it might be useful to just get a broad sense of overview of all the ingredients that are needed. And then we'll have some uh, deeper uh, dives later this week. Lecture two is going to be a pragmatic introduction to some of the useful tools of data analysis, such as a Fisher matrix or an um, MCMC algorithm. So just how do you sample a parameter space? Um, and that's going to be some coding uh, that's going to be involved there. Does everybody here have a laptop or sitting next to somebody who has a laptop? Who does not have a laptop and does not sit next to somebody who has a laptop? OK, great. Next question, who here does not have Python on their laptop of any shape or form? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Excuse me? Yeah, yeah, it's very easy, but I wanted to know. So if you don't have it, install it, please. Um, uh, it's going to be uh, most of the stuff that I will show is Python 2, but um, I, I don't think there is a version problem. Um, and. Uh, um, so, so great, There's going, you're going to, to work a little bit in teams, um, and, and that should be, should be easy given the amount of laptops that are around. Um, lecture number three is cosmological surveys from weak lensing to multiprobe analysis. We're going to go through um, some of the aspects that went into, into the DES analysis and also some of the other um, surveys that, that are happening at the same time, like the kilo degree survey and like the uh, hypersuprime cam survey, and we're going to mention a couple of cosmological tensions or non-tensions that exist in this, this realm of photometric cosmological surveys. And then lecture four, I hope that we've reached the goal that we can actually either um, do a, a, an analysis of DES data, a very simplified one, or that we can run some forecasts for LSST and W first, because it is important to to explore how a change in survey strategy and how a change in, in systematics uh, mitigation ideas, how that actually affects the science return of these missions, and that's what forecasting is about. So people sometimes think, ah, forecasting, that's so boring and it's so easy. It is really, it's definitely not easy. It might be boring, I agree. Um, but in principle, what you're trying to set up is a simulated likelihood analysis of the actual thing. You want to come as close as possible to just swapping out the theory data vector with an actual data vector that has been measured, and you should be able to run the whole analysis as, as if um, without very many changes. And that is very complex, that is very involved, and, but only if you set up such a machinery, you can actually forecast the science return precisely. So a lot of forecasts that are out there in the literature are not necessarily that meaningful. They are only true if you make the very specific assumptions and approximations that those authors have made. Um, and it's very important to, to remember that you have to set up a very complex analysis framework such that you can get precise forecasts for these missions. Um, and then from time to time, I'm going to sprinkle in some cosmological results uh, of, of contemporary surveys in, into these uh, lectures. Um, right, to get the most of these lectures and exercises, please bring your laptop. And there is a two-stage homework. One is please install uh, some Jupyter IPython notebook. Um, please try and have this ready tomorrow. And then there is a second part of the homework, which is to download um, um, the, the software package that was released together with the desk science uh, requirement document. So just some background information, science requirements are always important for surveys to define because then you know what your goals are, right? Before you deploy this huge machinery of a collaboration, you have to know what are your goals, what are your requirements for certain aspects. How well do I have to measure shapes? How well do I have to measure the astrometry? How well do I have to measure photometry? Et cetera, et cetera. Those are science requirements. And there exist very many documents for LSST and for DESC. DESC stands for Dark Energy Science Collaboration. That's the dark energy collaboration that is, um, that's the science collaboration that is going to analyze LSST dark energy data. 
And in this document, we have actually done some forecasts for LSST. So if you download the software package, um, it's like approximately 300 megabyte. It should be a standalone version of a code called Cosmolike that I'm working on. Um, it's a very slim trimmed down version, but you should be able to reproduce these forecasts. And it would be interesting, I think, for you to, to reproduce some of the LSST forecasts that were published in this document. This was uh, recently put on the archive. Well, it's not that recent. It was six months ago. Uh, Rachel, me, and very many others. Uh, Rachel Mandelbaum, myself, and very many others were involved in this. Um, so there's very little to non-coding experience um, uh, required. I'm sure there's much, much better coders in this room than I am. Um, and, and I think I can do what is required here. Um, and yeah, if you work in groups, there is one, uh, one important aspect that I would like you to take care of. If you, um, you should discuss things, you should pair code even, and you should make sure that people who might not be quite as strong that they can ask questions. So if you're a very good coder, just don't plug away and forget about your environment. Try to get the others involved as well. So asking a question, can you explain this code to me, is a very good question to ask when we work in groups. OK. Are there any questions about this so far? Yes? Oh, nice. I'm old. I'm old. That's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but go, go ahead. That's right. So LSST, um, uh, the, um, uh, all of the coding that is going to happen for the science analysis, et cetera, is going to be based on, on, on Python 3. That's correct. But this document here, because I did the computations, uh, was still done in Python 2. Um, and so you, um, yeah. And also the, the IPython notebook that I wrote for, for the other exercise, for the samplers exercise, is also going to be Python 2. Um, that's, that's the reason, yeah. But yes, good question, uh, and, it's, and very good information. LSST requires Python 3. It was a little bit controversial, but uh, yeah, people decided Python 3, and I'm actually fine with that. Um, okay, so the title of the lecture altogether is From Models to Data, and one of the questions could be, shouldn't it be from data to models, right? Data is the first thing that you have, and then you want to go to model. Well, it's not necessarily how most projects evolve. A lot of the projects actually start out the other way around. You have some model that you want to test. You probably come from the theory realm. You've done some you know, analytic calculations. You have implemented that into code. And then at some point, your supervisor tells you, and now you should test it on data. Very, very often. There's very many cables and things here, um, but I'll do my best. Um, right, so very often you start out with a, a, a model and theory project, and then you are supposed to apply it to data at some later point. And this is also how this lecture is going to be, to be structured. Mostly we will talk about the models and the theory, and then there will be a data connection from time to time. And it's very important for, uh, for students also to realize that this connection to the other realm, to the data realm, is extremely important even if you do most of the work in theory. Because at sooner or later you will have to understand, if you want to deploy your project on data, if you want to apply it to data, you will have to understand data you will have to know what are the uncertainties that I actually have to model in my analysis framework. Otherwise, otherwise you will be one of these very many theorists who just take their code, apply it to, to data, and then the result is not necessarily meaningful. Um, and, and that has happened in the, in the literature, and, and I would assume that students here would not want to be some of these people. Um, so knowing... Um, Knowing the data is a prerequisite. Um, you don't have to understand every aspect of image reduction. That's not what is meant here. But you have to understand what are the uncertainties. There's many uncertainties in, in, in the data uh, reduction process. And one should not assume that what you get from the catalog is perfect. It is not. So any column in a catalog 
should come with an uncertainty column. And you should be able to model that uncertainty as well as the observable. Um, right, and that also gives you a lot of um, street cred in, in the community. So, you this or that? This, is, this is actually okay. okay. If, if, if my left hand gets tired, I can switch. Um, <laughs> um, this is this is also what gets you a lot of street cred in the in the community. So if you are able to talk, uh, to, to basically wander between worlds, to go to the theorists and talk theory, to go to the data analysts, uh, to go to the data uh, reduction people and talk um, um, aspects of data reduction, then that is quite powerful. I think I'm going to switch back because this has an echo. Um, photometric cosmological surveys. So this is a timeline that I quickly wanted to throw out there because it might be useful for you to understand um, when I refer to these different endeavors, what am I talking about? And generally in the community, people refer to these surveys and um, uh, it is useful to have a quick overview. So in the past, people have been analyzing something that's called the CFHT lens survey. That's now done for well, actually, not too long ago, there were still papers uh, published on this. Um, now the community has moved on more to analyzing the KIT survey, the dark energy survey, the hyper supreme cam survey. So those are currently cosmological, photometric cosmological surveys um, um, where you can download data and where you can uh, have a look at yourself, have a look at it yourself. So all of these already have public versions out there. That's not necessarily the latest version, but it's very interesting to look at this. Um, um, what do I mean when I talk about photometric surveys? Who knows what that is? Like, ah, yes. Sorry, say it loud. Yeah. What is it? What is a different kind of survey? What is the difference? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, there's, I mean, so there's many types of surveys. There's also radio surveys, there's CMB surveys, right? There is, a, but as you said, there's spectroscopic surveys that measure the precise redshift of galaxies where you get in spectra for every individual object. There's photometric surveys, which is basically a camera pointing at the sky, and then it has a certain filter, and so it observes every object in multiple bands in multiple different colors. And that does not give you as much information as if you have a spectrum but it, in, it allows you to observe much, 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 much faster. So you get many, many, many more objects uh, in these photometric surveys. But the third dimension is less precise. Okay, so um, these are photometric surveys that are going on right now. These are surveys that are coming on, online in the future, and it's perhaps uh, good to know that uh, something like Euclid and also WFIRST have a spectroscopic component. They, they do have a spectroscopic component, but they also have an imaging component. So it's a satellite mission. Those are both satellites missions with multiple instruments on board. LSST does not have a spectroscopic component. So LSST is a survey that is going to map the visible sky that it can observe from its uh, position in, in Chile every three nights in about six bands. So it gets lots of, of images of these objects, but it does not get spectroscopic information. W first is going to map, um, well, the nominal survey size is 2,000 square degrees. The nominal survey size here is 18,000 square degrees. You can see this is supposed to illustrate the area that is covered by a survey. This is supposed to illustrate the depth of the survey. This has a much higher number density of objects. W first goes deeper. It is supposed to observe 50 galaxies per square arc minute. LSST is more like 30, but all of these numbers are subject to different cuts. So whenever somebody tells you, yeah, number density is 30, you have to ask, well, what exactly are you talking about? Is that the raw number density that you get off of the image immediately? Is that the number density you get after you've made all the quality cuts? Um, those are very, this can fluctuate quite a bit, um, depending on which quality cuts are being made. 
But the important takeaway here is that the next decade, and these are not launch dates, these are actually supposedly end dates for these surveys, um, the next decade is going to present the community with a wealth of cosmological uh, survey information. So it is a good field to be in, and it is good to understand what's going on here in order to be part of what's going on there. It's, we are not going to be data starved. This, I think, is going to have a data volume of the entire SDSS survey every night, if I'm not, entire, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, yeah, definitely not data starved. Um, now, how do we actually connect theory and data? Um, this is a very, um, well, a, a very abstract and not very detailed concept. I've, I've structured it in the way that this up here is the theory realm and this down here is actually the data realm. So, okay, you have your night sky, the photons come in, um, you, have, you have to understand instrumentation and detector physics. This is actually how an image looks like. Does anybody recognize this? What this is? Yes? It's a field of, so it's the focal plane of DECAM, yeah. That's right. Right, so these are CCDs. Um, it's a, it, sorry? Oh, the satellite streak, yeah, that's right. So this is raw data, and raw data, there is, there is airplanes going through, there are satellites going through. There is chip gaps that need to be accounted for. These chips have different sensitivities. They're not all equally sensitive. There is a chip that's actually dead. Down here is another chip that's actually dead. Um, so this is what you have to deal with, and this is what theorists and later want to do precision cosmology with. And that's just what I'm saying. You have to understand what happens here, and especially also what happens here, if you want to get your error bars right. Ultimately, we all want to test hypotheses. We all want to test, is lambda CDM right? Is it wrong? And we can only make a statement within a certain error bar. And getting that error bar right is the actual name of the game. That is what is complicated. It's not necessarily getting the precise value, or not only getting the precise value, it's really getting the error bar around that value correct. Okay, so you get your photons, the photons come in, they hit the detector, you get, this is the field of view, these are the different CCDs. Um, there's stars, there's galaxies, um, there's uh, dust, there's satellite streaks. And then from these measurements, um, there's a lot of software that people have built in the data management, in the DES data management, but also in other data management aspects, uh, where you do object detection. First of all, you have to detect objects. Some of these are extremely faint. You would not necessarily see them by eye. You have, they do the image pr uh, processing. They do astrometry. The position of, of objects need to be known to a very high precision. They do photometry. Photometry also needs to be known to a high precision, because otherwise you will get redshifts wrong and your whole um, your whole uh, measurement is going to be off. Um, and then if you're interested in weak lensing, like, like I myself, shape measurements. So from very, very faint objects, and we'll get into that in, in another lecture, you have to measure shapes. And that's very hard and delicate indeed. Now, if you do all of this correctly, you get a catalog of objects. That is the basis and perhaps the first thing that a theorist would look at. Um, I'm being a little bit presumptuous here, but very many people first start out with, okay, I'm going to take the catalog that you've created for me very nicely, and then I'm going to do my magic on it. Um, sometimes people not even work with the catalogs, but they work with what is called summary statistics. And that is a condensed version of the information of the catalog. But it is not lossless. You have lost some of the information when you operate with summary statistics. If you come from the theory side, Usually what people do when they build models is, well, you start out from a cosmological model, you assume something like lambda CDM or W CDM or a modified gravity model. Um, you generate initial conditions and you let gravity evolve. And if you have a fancy algorithm, you also have some hydrophysics in there. You have AGN going off, you have supernovae, you have all of the astrophysics messy stuff in your simulation as well. Um, but if you... If you don't have a fancy computer, then usually you just get the dark matter. That's already a fancy computer um, that is required for this. Um, this is not a laptop thing. Um, so here, this is a picture taken from the Millennium Simulation. This is the dark matter uh, structure that is visualized. But dark matter is not really what we see. 
So we need to make the connection to actually galaxies and light. And there's various methods how this can be done. You basically populate this dark matter simulation with galaxies. And you hope to a certain degree that, OK, light traces, um, light traces mass. Here is an overdensity. OK, I'm going to put a huge galaxy cluster right there. It's not that easy, but that's the zeroth order concept. And when you have this simulation with the galaxies in there, and if you also insert all sorts of astrophysical and, and other systematics effects, observational systematic effects, you can also generate a catalog from your simulation. And you can get a summary statistic from your simulation. And then you can compare what you've observed and what you've gotten from, um, what you've gotten from the simulation in a likelihood analysis. Now, Depending on what scales you're interested in, you don't necessarily have to run a numerical simulation. Depending on which effects you're interested in, you don't have to run one of these very expensive uh, uh, simulations that are able to capture nonlinear effects. You might get away with some kind of a fitting function and um, with, with some kind of a perturbation theory ansatz. But that does confine you to certain scales and or to certain objects that are mostly contamination free. If you are in, and, and unfortunately, that's not really where most of the information is. Most of the information is actually in the messy area. So it is, it is impossible to really get around running sophisticated simulations. OK, but this is actually the part we would like to talk about. Wow, I'm already half an hour in. OK, um, I quickly wanted to. Uh, talk about summary statistics. What are summary statistics? Um, does anybody know and want to give a first statement of what is a summary statistic, conceptually or very specific? Who here has never heard the word summary statistic? OK. OK. So the majority has. So you should roughly know what it is. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, the mean, an excellent example. Yes. The mean is, uh, is, is summarizes, uh, one as uh, summarizes an aspect of, of, of a distribution. That's right. Other summary statistics? Variance. Sorry? Variance. Yeah, variance. So now we, we approach um, uh, the topic of, of so-called endpoint functions. So summary statistics can be something like endpoint function. In, in an abstract sense, a summary statistics captures some information of the underlying of the underlying dense of the underlying field, probability field. So in this case, we have a density field. This is our galaxy density field. Just going, sorry, going back here. Dark matter field, populate with galaxies. You get the galaxy density field. Um, and then we're interested in summary statistics. And if you're interested in second order summary statistics, you look at correlation functions or power spectra. So most of you who have worked in cosmology a little bit have definitely heard the word power spectra and correlation functions. And the connection is simply a Fourier transform. Um, and for a density field, for a 3D density field, we have the matter power spectrum um, or the galaxy uh, power spectrum. Those are not the same. Um, um, that can be summarized as a function of, of k. And k is roughly inverse um, uh, length scale. So here we have very, very large scales. This is the universe on large scales. This is the universe on very small scales. This is linear structure growth, how it's called. Here you can see BAO wiggles, and here we have nonlinear structure. And for nonlinear structure, that's exactly where we need uh, uh, numerical simulations. There is other kinds of summary statistics. Um, so for example, so we've mentioned two-point correlation functions. That's just you look at um, uh, two different points. You draw a connecting vector. But you can also look at uh, three-point correlation functions, which is a triangle in this case. And you can look at, um, at, at, non, well, at uh, summary statistics that are not endpoint functions, something like voids. 
Um, who here knows what voids are? Yes? <laughs> Sorry? I, I'll just... Yeah, they're, they're regions of emptiness, indeed. Um, so the, the number of, of, of voids um, that you can measure in, in, your, in your catalog once you identify them, the number and also scale of voids, um, is a measure of cosmology. If you run a different numerical simulation where you start out at a different cosmological model, you will find more or fewer voids with larger or smaller volume. And uh, the opposite of a void, in principle, is a, a cluster. So a void is an underdensity where there is less matter compared to the, to the mean of the, of the universe, um, um, or the density contrast is less. Um, whereas if you have a cluster, then you have an overdensity. And the number of clusters that you see as a function of mass and redshift is also a summary statistics of that density field. OK, then there is something that's called gravitational lensing. So for now, we've just looked at the connection between, we've just looked at the galaxy density field. And we hope that the galaxies kind of trace the dark matter. But there is a different effect. And gravitational lensing traces the dark matter directly. It is sensitive to dark and luminous matter. So the idea of lensing is just depicted here. You have a galaxy, it emits light. Um, there is a huge overdensity in the way between the emitting galaxy and the observer. And you can see that light follows the geodesic, so it is actually bent. So you can, if, if there is an extremely strong lens, as is here depicted, uh, you, will, you can see this galaxy multiple times even. But that is not necessarily true for what we call cosmological weak lensing or cosmic shear, because there the effect is much less strong. So here we have this massive galaxy cluster is a huge gravitational uh, force that is, um, that is present in this vicinity. But if we look at the universe as a whole, if we look at the dark matter distribution, and that is depicted here, then the gravitational strength there is much less. So cosmic shear is usually not what you see in these pretty pictures with like multiple images that are behind a galaxy cluster. It is something much more subtle. If this is the dark matter distribution, then you have light that is emitted from faint galaxies, and it travels through this dark matter distribution. And there is very, very small deflections that happen due to the gravitational uh, potential change that, that this light ray encounters. And so what you as an observer will, actually, will see is a small distortion of that galaxy. So something that is an ellipse will be, at the end, a little bit more an ellipse or a little bit less an ellipse. And this can be measured statistically. And the statistical properties of this two-dimensional shear field that you observe when you measure the galaxy shapes, so you can measure the shapes directly to the shear, and the statistical properties of that shear field, they reflect the statistical properties of the density field. So you measure the, the shear field, you measure statistical properties like two-point functions, three-point functions, and then you can relate these properties to the actual matter density field. And that is a direct tracer of dark and luminous matter. There's no assumption like, oh, I think my galaxy is, I have a lot of galaxies over here, so I think I have a lot of dark matter over there. That's not uh, a weak lensing. Weak lensing is immune to any assumptions in this realm. OK. Yeah, and this is just the, the projection in 2D. And if you could see the dark matter, you would kind of see that galaxies like this one align tangentially to, um, uh, to these overdensities. But there's lots of uncertainties in weak lensing, and we'll probably go into those uh, in another lecture. OK, um, please take out one of these papers that I mentioned at the beginning. Just take one paper sheet. Um, Describe what summary statistics are conceptually. Just write down a couple of sentences, or one, two sentences. Um, can you name summary statistics of cosmological observables? We heard two already. Those are not the ones that are most commonly used, but I mentioned a bunch of them. Um, and what's your opinion on why don't we use the catalogs directly? Why do we go through these summary statistics thing? Why don't, I've mentioned galaxy catalogs that we obtain from the images, why don't we use those? It's another question, why don't we use the images directly? Oh, no, they're, they're writing it on the sheet of paper. 
yeah, then, then we'll get a mic, yeah. Um, Okay, so the idea is you write it down. You will just exchange it with somebody, so nobody has to read their own thing, but do make it legible, such that the person who's reading your stuff uh, can actually do so. You can also discuss and work in groups. This is fine. <laughs> There's no need to be silent right now. Do you want to know the time? <laughs> it's like two or three minutes more. OK. I have to press that button. Talk and discuss. I mean, especially the latter question is something that you can discuss. The, the others are, I mean, I mentioned that. That's fine. But what's your opinion? Why don't we use the catalogs directly? Sorry? You don't know? No, there's, this is a discussion thing. It's not... Uh, it's not a precise answer. So I'm going to be very open here that some people are suggesting we should use the catalogs directly, and they're trying to implement a corresponding framework. But that has problems. And so which ones? Why do people still use summary statistics? All right, one more minute. Okay, when you're, when you're done writing, just take that piece of paper. Don't use the whole stash. Just that one piece of paper and hand it to somebody else in the room and get their paper in return. You're not going to get it back. So just that one piece of paper. You're not going to get it back. I'm just saying. <laughs> Okay, I'm turning around, okay. <laughs> it's fair. Please exchange papers now. Okay. No, I'm not going to count down. You can count down. Ten, nine, no pressure. Eight, <laughs> seven, five, four, three. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, exchange with some other group. That's all there is. No, 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 no. Not far. Just be efficient. Be efficient. Just. Yeah.
Okay. Okay. Um, who would like to read? Who would like to read? There's no pressure. You're reading somebody else's answer. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> what are summary statistics conceptually? The con they content most relevant information of the data. In principle, they are moments of a probability dis distribution. Um, moments characterize fully the distribution, for example, endpoint correlation functions. Yeah, there's, that's very good. There is, there is not much to add, un, except for perhaps it's not guaranteed that these summary statistics uh, capture the bulk of the information. That's actually something that you would hope and something that you should make sure of, but it's not guaranteed. So, for example, to what order of n do you have to go to capture the information? Where is it contained? It's not that clear. Um, um, somebody else, uh, the second answer, please. Thank you. And thanks yeah. to the anonymous writer. <laughs> Okay, um, catalogs need to be created, uh, yeah, created. They contain many errors, uh, right? Catalog data should be interpreted and not be used directly. Not be used directly, okay, interesting. Um, so, it is true that catalogs contain errors, but if they contain errors and you propagate them into the summary statistics, right, those errors are still in the summary statistics. So that's not necessarily the main reason why we don't use the catalogs directly. It is true. I mean, everything that was said is true. They, they contain errors, and these errors need to be modeled. That's all correct. But it's not really a, a reason uh, to, to, to prefer summary statistics over catalogs. I mean, uh, one, one other uh, answer to that question, please? No, it's very close to the... Okay. Oh, still, still, still. No, no, no. We're, we're going to take it. That's good. Please, please read. <laughs> Errors may be spread in the survey. If it's the answer. Maybe sp spread? Spread? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So same, same thing does apply. Well, what's the main difference between a summary statistic and, uh, and uh, uh, a whole catalog that characterizes a density field? Somebody has mentioned a mean. A mean is, yeah, do you want to? No, yeah. That's right. Um, okay. I think at the catalog you have a lot of extra information, and when you are working with summary statistics, you kind of selected what information is relevant for your analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is that is also one reason. That's right. Um, you can make selections on the catalog as well, actually, right? You can make cuts on the catalog, and you could work with the catalog. But it is true that a lot of the selections happen at the level of summary statistics. So you said that there is data compression involved. Yeah. And that's one of the main reasons. So catalogs are huge. If you have ever seen one of these catalogs that DES has produced now, it's millions, tens of millions of objects. The LSST raw catalog is going to, I mean, the, the weak lensing catalog is probably going to be a billion of objects. The detection catalog is going to be 10 billion objects. If you're looking at some simulations um, that LSST has, uh, uh, has created without any magnitude cuts, so meaning there's all these very, very faint objects in there, that is a number density of approximately 1,000 galaxies per square arc minute. I mentioned other number densities on one of the very early slides. It was just 30 or something like that, right? But the catalog that is created out of the simulations before any cuts is 1,000 objects per square arc minute. And now you can do the math. There is 18,000 square degrees. One square degree has 3,600 square arc minutes. You can calculate how many objects are in this catalog. That's a lot. So dealing with that number of objects is just very, very hard. And that's why people usually compute summary statistics to have a condensed uh, version of that information, but it can be processed more easily in a likelihood analysis. Now, the very advanced computer people obviously feel challenged by something like that, and they would like to do likelihood analysis at the catalog level directly. 
It requires them to build a forward modeling machinery that can generate lots and lots of catalogs as a function of cosmological parameters, going through all of the steps. So dark matter simulation, galaxies on top of it. Um, then they actually also have an, an image simulation uh, pipeline where they, where they map how the telescope would observe this, uh, uh, this, these, these particular objects. And then they create the catalogs again. So this forward modeling machinery is extremely expensive. And there is a lot of machine learning involved when people are building this. And they are not yet there. They can do this on some. They can do some version of that, but they cannot yet do the very sophisticated version that has all the ingredients in them, uh, not by far. Um, so for now, we're still doing summary statistics. And actually, we are doing two-point functions. We have not even yet progressed to meaningful three-point function measurements. So there's lots of room for people to shine, uh, just saying. OK. Um, I was actually hoping that I was at this slide and just like, like 15 minutes in. This is uh, going a little bit slower than I thought. Sorry. Um, what connects data and models? So first of all, um, you, already, you still have that participation form from that other group, right? Um, please answer this. Which one of these figures corresponds to, to data? Which one corresponds to, um, uh, to, to the model realm? And then if you had to describe what you see here on the left and if you had to describe what you see here on the right, please do. Just one sentence. So we're going to do this much shorter. This is just like three minutes. Please answer these questions quickly on that sheet that you got from the other group and then pass it on to somebody else. This is the connection we actually want to talk about in this lecture. The first question is very easy. The second one is actually not so easy. And I'm looking for an abstract description, right? You don't have to know exactly from which survey this is and et cetera, et cetera. But what do you see here? Why is there these different contours, et cetera, et cetera? And you should, again, be discussing, especially the second part, that can't be so easy. Okay, one more minute. What? The what? Each student has a click. You can click yes or no, so you can have make tests that can check. Yeah, but I'm down. Yeah. You should end it. Yeah. <laughs> Clickers. <laughs> Very good, yeah. OK, please exchange your paper sheets with somebody else. Finish your sentences and exchange them. Is horrible. I thought I'd be here after 20 minutes. 
<laughs> I see the universe and how we dream of the universe. It's kind of a nice answer. Okay. Um, last chance. Please exchange. Um, okay. Who would like to read uh, their neighbors or not neighbors answer? The first one is a giveaway. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Uh, well. Left is the model. Sorry. Left is the model space, and right is the data space. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Um, and because that was um, rather easy, please read the second one as well. <laughs> yeah. So left is the likelihood analysis to estimate cosmological parameters from a summary statistics, and right uh, is the dark energy camera CCDs raw data. Yeah. That's right. So, I mean, we've, we've already discussed this um, and what you can see here, satellite streaks, there's stars, there's galaxies, um, there's the individual chips and gaps. And this indeed, can you quickly read that part again? That was just the first... Um, uh, likelihood analysis to estimate cosmological parameters from a summary statistics. Yeah, okay. So this is... So a likelihood analysis was performed, but I would not necessarily describe this as a likelihood analysis. Would somebody else want to... To read their version? Man, no. are you time to shine? Come on. Somebody else shines. It's just somebody needs to read. Perfect. So the left side, uh, we're trying to do constraints on values of cosmological parameters. Yeah. So this is called a pro posterior probability. And this is a depiction of the posterior probability in some version of model space. And model space is always uh, characterized through parameters. So here we have two cosmological parameters, omega matter and sigma 8. Um, normalization of the power spectrum that, well, this is S8. That's a combination of sigma 8 and omega matter. Sigma 8 is the normalization of the power spectrum, basically tells you how much um, clustering of, of matter there is in the universe. And omega matter is um, uh, the matter density. Uh, parameter. And these are just different data sets that have been analyzed here. And these are the uh, marginalized distributions where you integrate over the other dimension. So this is the 1D distribution in S8. You have integrated over the uncertainty in omega matter. And this is the marginalized distribution of omega matter. You have integrated over the uncertainty in sigma 8. Okay. This is how you can project down from a higher dimensional parameter space into a lower dimensional parameter space. You integrate over the uncertainty of the other parameters. And let's face it, in this analysis, there were more parameters to begin with than just two. Right? So lots of these parameters that, are, that went into this likelihood analysis, um, they're actually hidden here. They have already been integrated over uh, or or um, the integration has happened over their uncertainties, and that's already included here. That's what's called marginalization. You marginalize over these other parameters. Okay, now we're going to get into what does this blue arrow mean. Um, so back to the main question, how do we connect models and data? This is one of the main equations that people uh, who are doing statistical inference, uh, Bayesian statistical inference, um, uh, should know, and you've probably seen that already. So please write down your knowledge on that participation form of the other person. This is now going very fast. Sorry, I'm really making you do stuff. It's not just me working here, it's also you. So what are the, the different ingredients in this, um, uh, of this equation? What's on the left-hand side? What does P mean? What is M? What is D? And what's on the right-hand side of this equation? <laughs> yeah, that, that's very good. M is model, D is data, that's right. And now you have to basically make a sentence of what is this? You should write it. Uh, no, wait, wait, wait. This is just one P. Should, should they write down or? Yeah, everybody should write down in write principle. Down. So, but I mean, I'm not going to cut off somebody who wants to talk. That's, 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 that's clearly fine. Yeah, so there was a lot of good information that people could write down. D is data, M is model, P is something, probability, there were some other words floating around. 
Hmm? Of the is, is, is <laughs> yes, some somebody's nightmare. Mine. <laughs> <clears throat> this is the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, sorry. Ah. We want to get here, and we have this. So we have data, and we want to get to these contours. I've already said that this is a posterior probability. This is the most abstract level of what data analysis is doing, this theorem. And if you start out from that, and if you can fill in all the ingredients, you're very good and very welcome to join collaborations. Yes, they should exchange. So when you're done, please do exchange. Um, you can start exchanging now. I, I'm really not an authority here. It's, I don't think I should turn around. It's like Okay, one more minute. We're going to exchange at exactly 3 p.m. Dear God. Okay, please exchange now, and somebody please read. Um, I mean, by now these participation forms should have wandered around the room already, so. <laughs> Just read somebody else's stuff? <laughs> yes. I think on the left we have probability of a particular model given the dat data, given mm -hmm. some data. Yeah, that's right. So this is called the posterior probability, right? This is what happens after you've done this calculation. Okay, what do we have here? What are the ingredients? This is what we want, right? This is what we can plot. This is actually what has been plotted uh, here. So what's on the right-hand side? The likelihood, so the probability of getting the data given the model. Yeah. And <laughs> the, the other one is the prior, so the assumption on the model. Okay. And, uh, and, and the, uh, there is the probability of getting some data. It is the evidence, but I don't really remember the... Yeah, okay. Th this is also one. not important um, for, for purposes here. Vivian would object it. <laughs> <laughs> For some people, this is very important. Um, so this is the evidence, but for our purposes here, this is a normalization factor. Um, this is useful when comparing different models, when doing model comparison, actually. But for the purposes of working within one model, this is just a normalization, a constant. Those two are the important ones. And you've correctly said, this is what we want, posterior probability. This is the likelihood, as a probability of the data given a specific model, a specific realization. 
And this is prior information that we have already. If we don't know anything, that's that should also go into the likelihood analysis, although that might be difficult. Non-informative priors, is how it's called, are actually not that easy to generate. It's a very, very tricky business to identify the prior correctly. But if you're saying, I want to combine my new data set that I've gotten, like DES, I want to combine it with Planck. And if you assume that they're independent, then your prior can just be the Planck result and you combine it with DES, okay? In that case, it's easy. You know what the prior is, Planck gives it to you. Um, and you combine it with your very sophisticated data analysis. If you're saying, I just want to know what my experiment in itself tells me, you have to generate a non-informative prior. And sometimes people say, well, I'm just going to assume a flat prior, right? So if I look at the parameter omega matter, I'm just going to assume that the probability, the 1D probability distribution from, let's say, 1 to whatever, 0 0.1, is going to be flat. Right? There's no preference, supposedly. But you don't know how omega matter actually enters into the calculation of your model. It might enter in some weird functional way. And then suddenly, there is going to be some information coming from one of these values that is much higher compared to some of the others. So generating uninformative priors or non-informative priors is hard, and it depends on how does your parameter enter in the likelihood analysis. How does it enter in the model? And that's not easy. Um, OK, spend a lot of time on that. That's just a summary of that. Yeah, posterior probability, model-given data. Data-given model, that's the likelihood. Um, prior probability, that's some prior information that you have probability of data that's usually a constant. I don't know why it's usually here, it's a constant, as far as I know. Um, OK, so this one is actually hard, and we have to work on that. Um, and there is an important step that's included here. A model usually needs a parameterization. So whenever we talk of m, that's a, that's a, that's a function. It is m of p. It is a model given of, of certain parameters. And p is a vector, so it consists of several parameters. Um, and there is a disclaimer that in this lecture and also uh, in the literature, you will see p and pi used interchangeably. Here are some of the parameters that were used in, uh, in the likelihood analysis of the dark energy survey. So we've already mentioned omega matter. We've mentioned S8, which is a combination of sigma 8 and omega matter. Um, this is the Hubble constant or the Hubble parameter H. This is W, the um, dark energy. Uh, parameter, the energy equation of state parameter. So whatever model you define M, you have to also specify what kind of parameters come with it. And it's not just cosmological parameters. It's also what we call nuisance parameters that describe uncertainties. And those are sometimes very hard to identify how do they enter your model. Whereas here, you would perhaps say, well, CAMP tells you how omega matter enters my enters my model. But does CAMP tell you how shear calibration or photo Z uncertainties enter your model? Not necessarily. There might be some version of that in CAMP. Um, OK, let's go into details. Uh, this is Bayes' theorem. This is pi. It was formerly p. Um, so we have the posterior probability of our model given the data. The data is given. We want to know what is this. And we mentioned, yeah, OK, prior. We mentioned there is a likelihood function that's important. This, is, this was uh, denoted in the previous slide as P of data given the model. And we already see here that it's not just the model, but there is this C this, uh, that appears, and, and we will get into what that actually means as well. So um, let's go into some details. Let's assume you're designing a likelihood analysis for one of these photometric surveys that I mentioned, DES, LSST, or W first. What kind of priors could you put here. Let's not write that down. Let's just shout. Shout. Um, uniform? A Gaussian prior depending on the parameter. OK. Right. Well, so, so it's, it's 
true that you can assume informative priors like a Gaussian prior if you have um, if you have that prior information from some other source, right? If you think, I know the uncertainty on my shape measurements, I know this is the fiducial value, and then I don't trust it entirely, let's say, um, oh, let's do this. This is M. M is frequently used for uncertainty on shape measurements. Let's say you have a fiducial value. Sometimes this is centered on zero, sometimes not necessarily. And from the data, you get some kind of a Gaussian um, with a certain width. So you get this either from simulations or you get it from the data directly. And then you can put this kind of a distribution, a Gaussian prior, on this parameter m, which is somewhere in this vector pi. That's right. Um, in terms of cosmological information, uh, prior information that we can get is from other independent probes. So that's when you go out to the other data sets. That's when you go out to Planck and you look at what does Planck have to say about my specific model, right? You cannot take a Planck WCDM analysis and then combine that with your Lambda CDM analysis. You have to stay within a certain model, right? Um, so you go to these other data sets, Planck, Supernovae, and you use that as prior information. Or you try to have a non-informative prior here. Okay. Let's move on. Um, what is this blue thing over here? We're going this way around. Uh, huh. no, no, I wanted to actually, I wanted to mention that. So this is the model vector. This is something that has the same dimension as the data vector. So if your data vector is this, um, d1, dn, then your model vector will have the exact same dimension. Um, and you can see there is a dependency here. So this means the model vector is a function of the parameters in my likelihood analysis, so of my model. I have specified a model. The model has 26 parameters. And um, my, my model vector is a function of these 26 parameters. And Making that statement comes with a huge amount of work because you have to develop the ability to predict this model vector as a function of the 26 parameters, right? There has to be that connection. It's not really trivial to build something like that. When you change omega matter, you have to have a machinery that tells you what is the change on the model vector. When you change any one of the shear calibration parameters or photo Z parameters, you have to have a machinery that tells you what is the change on the model vector. And it is important to note that these model vectors, um, they contain the exact same quantity conceptually as the data vector. And the data vector we've already discussed contains summary statistics, right? So the model vector also contains summary statistics. And we mentioned one of the reasons why would we use summary statistics, because there is data compression and they should, and summary statistics are generally uh, smaller, so have less entries compared to if we were using the catalogs directly. If we were using the catalogs directly here, the dimensionality of this would be millions and billions. If we're using a summary statistic, depending on the multi-probe analysis that you're envisioning, that is a couple of thousand. Um, it's still a lot. Um, okay, so we have, to, we have to have the ability to forward model this as a function of cosmological parameters and of nuisance parameters. And that's a new term, but probably people know what nuisance parameters are in contrast to cosmological parameters. Somebody, somebody dares to speak? What are nuisance parameters? Uh, wait, 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 wait. Chris, come on. You've already said something, so you. <laughs> Anybody else who, who wants to comment on the term nuisance parameters? Yes? Uh, would be parameters that you would marginalize, that you are not interested in the, in the final probability distribution. distribution. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's exactly right. And um, it is also to some people very offensive if you call certain things, nuisance parameters, because, um, well, somebody's trash is a different person's gold, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
what are nuisance, I mean, of course, we're all interested in W, right? W is like the best parameter, the most important one. We're never going to marginalize over that. That's, we're going to, always going to show that. But um, sometimes a nuisance parameter is, for example, baryonic physics. How strong is AGN feedback in the universe, right? And if you call that a nuisance parameter and you go to the galaxy formation people, they're really interested in that. And they don't care about W, right? They would marginalize over W, and they would call that a nuisance parameter in order to get to the strength of the AGN feedback. So um, just a word of caution. A caution. Nuisance is, is uh, in the eye of the, of the beholder. Um, nevertheless, for cosmological analyses, the cosmological parameters of interest, they are of order 10. The nuisance parameters that uh, uh, describe all of your uncertainties that you have, they are of order, well, several tens, perhaps even into the thousands. And that's where a very interesting research topic comes into play, which is parameter compression. We've already talked about data compression. So we're going from galaxy catalogs with billions of entries to like summary statistics, which have thousands. But there is also great interest in checking on well, do I really need that many parameters, or are they heavily intertwined, and I can probably reduce it to just five? How many parameters do I really measure with my data? It's unlikely that you're going to measure a uh, thousand parameters with very high accuracy. Um, OK. So we talked about the large model vector. I quickly wanted to go over these again to make clear what goes into the model vector. So just very conceptually, if you have a multi-probe model vector, we already talked about this. This is, uh, there is one um, a summary statistic that is called galaxy clustering. That's usually abbreviated as W of theta. And that in itself is a vector, um, which means this is not just a function of, 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 well, of angular separation, but it is also a function of redshift. So you will start binning your galaxies. You chop them into redshift bins. And then you look at, uh, and then you have the function of angular separation on the sky. And you will create many different data points of W as a function of how far are they apart. It's a two-point statistic. And in which redshift bin are those? So this in itself is going to be a couple of hundred data points. Um, we also talked about gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing, well, I'm just going to write that down. That's something, it looks like, it's a xi, xi plus minus. It's also a large data vector. And it's also, also a, a function of angular separation and of redshift bin. And then there is a cross-correlation between these two. Um, that's called galaxy-galaxy lensing. It's abbreviated as gamma t. And again, it's a function of theta, and it's a function of z, um, well, actually, lens and source. So each one of these, and this is only three different probes. Each one of these is a bunch of data points. And you can extend this data vector. You can make it longer. You can have cluster number counts in there. You can have CMB lensing in there. You can have cluster weak lensing in there. So this is not the end of the story. And each and every one of these has to be predicted as a function of the parameters that you're interested in. And so building this um, for such a large data vector is actually quite complex. Um, yeah, we talked about cosmic shear. That's it. Now we come to the C. So we've covered our model vector. We roughly know what goes in there. It's summary statistics, and I have to be able to predict the summary statistics as a function of the parameters. But that's not the only ingredient here. There's also the C. So what's the C? What do you, what, what is still missing? You have your data. You have the ability to forward model your data as a function of the parameters. What's missing? Anybody? Systematics. Yeah. So this is a covariance. What is a covariance? Sorry. Uh, do you want to go for this or? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is a covariance matrix? That's. It is right. This is a covariance matrix. But conceptually, it could also be a variance. It doesn't have to be a covariance, to be honest. <laughs> 
So the covariance is going to measure the covariance between your parameters and the errors, so the covariance between different pixels in the sky. In the diagonal, you have the error for that specific pixel. Mm -hmm. So it codifies the error bars. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm going to disentangle a couple of things here. Um, so first of all, you're right that there is a covariance matrix for the parameters as well. But it's important to separate these two. There is a data covariance matrix and there is a parameter covariance matrix. From your posterior probability, right, when you get your MCMC chain, you can calculate a parameter covariance matrix. That's correct. But it's not this one. This one is the data covariance matrix. And you mentioned pixels as an example. That would be a form of data. That's right. And speaking in an abstract way, this, is, this quantifies two things. Um, Ah, we're already here. Um, so this is a covariance matrix, very good. Um, this, and this is an example for a covariance matrix, and I'll probably talk about that at some other point in time. Um, but you can see this is relatively large. It has different blocks. That corresponds to the different probes that I have mentioned here. So W of theta is actually, oh god, I'm never going to, it's this tiny thing over here. That is the uncertainty. Uh, corresponding to W of theta, and this one corresponds to weak lensing, etc. cetera. Um, but what is a covariance matrix and what is it good for? It tells you how correlated your data points are. If you change one, what are the dependencies? Are you going to change another one in order to keep the same chi-squared? Um, and it also tells you what are the uncertainties on the individual data points. Okay. So the covariance matrix is hard and difficult to get. Covariances are scary, so we're going to move on. Um, what is this L? So yeah, it is, it is a likelihood. I heard that. I'm very good, whoever said it. Um, but do we know that a priori? What is that? I mean, I write it down as an L, but that's not going to help you. You can't plug that into Mathematica. Yes. It is the distribution of the, the difference between the, the model and the data. Usually it's a Gaussian, but it can be some other thing. Interesting. So let's stick with that last statement. Usually it is a Gaussian, but um, so why would it be a Gaussian? Asking everybody. And is it a Gaussian? Well, if you are taking about many parameters by this central limit theorem, it will reduce to a Gaussian in the end. Right. So the well, so yeah, that that's a that is a general statement about the like. So the likelihood function is on the data. It is a question of how are the errors on your data distributed, right? And so if that if your data in this case is 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 a scalar, then that central limit theorem kind of kind of does hold. But if that is a two-point function already. There is no, there's not necessarily a reason um, why the central limit theorem guarantees that a two-point function, um, well, okay, it's more complicated. Let's assume that your original data is distributed as a Gaussian, right? Your shear field. So your, 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 the shear field that you have, let's go back to this thing. The shear field that you have is distributed as a Gaussian. It's a two-dimensional Gaussian field, right? But now you're computing a summary statistics on that shear field. You're computing a two-point correlation function. So you have measured the shear. The shear is gamma. Um, but now you're measuring something that is gamma, gamma. Two-point correlation function. Um, it is not necessarily guaranteed that that is also distributed as a Gaussian. Um, and then it is also not really guaranteed that if you have done this for multiple data points, for multiple size, that that is still distributed as what is called a multivariate Gaussian. Right? We're talking here about high dimensional um, probability uh, uh, spaces as well. So um, it is exactly right that this can be a Gaussian. It is assumed that it is a Gaussian. But it is not at all guaranteed, and this is a topic of active research to quantify 
is it a Gaussian in the case of weak lensing? Is it a Gaussian in the case of, um, of, of galaxy number densities? Because imagine, or, or because remember, the shear field is kind of Gaussian, but if you go to small scales, small separations, it becomes, because of nonlinear structure growth, it becomes non-Gaussian on small scales. So even that is not uh, guaranteed for gamma on all scales that it is a Gaussian. Mm -hmm. And now you're doing this two-point function operator. And a lot of the nice probability theory kind of goes away. And you're sometimes rescued by the central limit theorem, but exactly when and in what case is not, is not that clear. So um, what I did when I was uh, uh, young and had lots of time was actually I took a set of uh, numerical simulations, a thousand simulations that were all computed at the exact same point in cosmology. So it should be the exact same thing. And then you can, um, the, and then I picked one data point. So let's just look at this upper thing over here. And that corresponds to one particular data point. What is it? So it's psi plus. It's a correlation function of shear um, at redshift of 2, z equals 2. And what is it? Theta, 5 arc minutes. OK? So this is a very, very specific data point in this very, very large data vector. Angular separation of five arc minutes and redshift of two. And you get 1,000 realizations from these 1,000 simulations. And you can plot them as a 1D histogram. And you can check, is this really a Gaussian? So if it was a Gaussian with mean and variance that you can compute from these 1,000 realizations, it would follow the blue histogram. It would follow the blue curve over here. That corresponds to a Gaussian. And the histogram that I got was this one. And the best fit to this histogram is the red one. Um, so I've shown this to a couple of statisticians, right? This one might worry you a little bit. These are QQ plots. They tell you the deviation from, from 1D Gaussian. Um, and there is not yet a conclusive answer. There have been several papers on this, and several statisticians have also told me, well, I've I've modeled stuff as Gaussian that looked way worse than this. Um, so yeah, I wasn't necessarily that happy with that answer. But um, I think it is still a topic of, of, um, of active research, although we have um, recently done this again with a grad student from, from CMU. And we don't really find that LSST weak lensing should worry about this. How? Sorry? It's not Gaussian. Well, yeah, but in the, yeah, for the low L, yeah. you care, yeah. So for, for CMB, it's, it's correct. Um, so if, if you look at the CMB, and I don't know, you probably had a lecture on the CMB here, so you know that there is modes, right? And if you take the mode of L equals 2, you're considering very, very large scales in the universe. So how many independent modes are there in the universe? Because that's what rescues you. If you have lots and lots of independent modes, then the central limit theorem kicks in. Then something is distributed as a Gaussian. But L2, you don't. L3, you do not. Um, so in that case, you have so few realizations that the central limit theorem does not rescue you, and you have to go um, to something that's called a, a, a Vichert distribution, or chi-squared distribution in this case. Um, but the CMB is much easier than weak lensing. Weak lensing is very messy. It has this nonlinear structure evolution of the late universe. Modes couple weirdly. Um, the CMB is much cleaner. The underlying field, the underlying temperature field, is much more as a Gaussian um, to begin with. So the problems that the CMB has solved by saying, okay, on very large scales, we're going to use the correct chi-square distribution, that's not really a solution for cosmic shear. We don't even have that large scales. So we don't even go to L of 2 in cosmic shear or L of 3. We don't have that kind of a problem. Our problem is that we have lots of nonlinear structure uh, uh, growth at late times, and that stuff weirdly, uh, is weirdly correlated across different scales. That's our problem. And it's not yet been, been solved entirely. I think um, there are some papers who claim that it's important. Uh, what we found is that it is less important. But um, pulling it all together, I think that's actually going to be my last slide, um, just halfway through. Which um, is, um, yeah, let's have a look at what are the main ingredients that are um, 
that are making up for a, for a likelihood analysis uh, that you need for photometric cosmological surveys and that hopefully will lead to a multi-probe analysis. So we're interested in the posterior probability. That's the nice contours um, of the parameters given the data. That's what you want to know. You have prior information and you have to calculate the likelihood. Prior information, kind of easy to include. Calculating the likelihood precisely is not so easy. So what are the main problems? Well, you have to have the ability to forward model your data vector, or to fo and that's then called the model vector. So you have to generate this thing, and you have to generate it for a lot of different pies. So you have, so whatever you generate, whatever you built here to generate this, this, this model vector has to be fast. You can imagine that at some point, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture, you sample a parameter space, and you want this MCMC chain to move fast. You cannot have it stuck somewhere for like one minute and then move on another minute. These chains are long. They have millions of, of, um, uh, of, of points, and that's not how long you want to wait. So this needs to be fast and still precise. And so that's, that's a hard problem, and, and building um, software for that is not easy. It involves a lot of code comparison. It involves a lot of fine tuning on like, OK, what precision of the integral is really necessary here? And then somebody says, OK, but now our analysis is going to smaller scales. And then whatever you set as precision of that integral is suddenly obsolete. And you can, you can do it all again. So there is a lot of interdependencies that have to go into building something like this. Um, the covariance matrix, crucial in order for you to get the right error bars. So this covariance matrix is, as we've seen, it can be large, it can be complicated. For our purposes of, of large-scale structure analysis, things are very, very heavily correlated. And so there's different methods for the derivation, ranging from numerical simulations to analytical methods to even methods to get it directly from the data. Getting this right will determine whether you get your error bars right on your model. And it will determine whether your statement, ah, OK, lambda CDM is now finally falsified, whether that is correct or not. right? So it is critical to get this right. Um, the likelihood function is another source of uncertainty. Yes, multivariate Gaussian frequently assumed. It's easy. To be, it can be easily calculated. The functional form, it has very nice properties. But is it really correct? And if it is slightly incorrect, do we care? Or do we tolerate it? And I think that's still somewhat an open question, although there has been progress. This is um, solved for individual probes to a certain extent. But for multi-probe analysis, this is, very, um, this is still not necessarily solved. And it is every covariance matrix is its, its own beast. So the things you need to take care of for building a covariance matrix for building a covariance matrix depends a lot on what exact analysis you want to run. So in order to get this right, you really need to create this feedback loop of like observations, simulations, and theory. That's really what can guarantee that you build a machinery that predicts your model vector precisely and that gives you the right error bars. Okay, and I think I'm going to leave it here, uh, although I'm really not through, um, but I think this is a good place to stop. Thank you. Oh, is there questions? Oh, cool. Uh, my question is about independent probes, like CMB yes. type 1A uh, priors. Those teams can also do similar analysis, and in their calculation, they can take our DS as a uh, prior. Yeah. In that sense, uh, the first team who publish what will be prior for the other teams. Yeah. So I made, yeah. So when I was um, still young, I made this mistake in a very large audience that I said, well, okay, and here we have our fancy weak lensing. This is all great. And we're going to use the supernovae as priors. So it was a large audience. And a fair fraction of them was supernovae people. And they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, I, we're not going to be your prior. You're going to be our prior. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's really important to note right from the beginning that, that that is, of course, interchangeable. And one more aspect that I would like to note, it is not clear if they're really independent, right? If you go for the CMB temperature field, that's right. 
you might you might be fine to assume that that's independent from the low redshift cosmic shear and galaxy density field. Um, but if you do CMB lensing, there's clearly a correlation. And at that point, you can no longer use CMB data points here in the prior. You actually have to add it to the data vector and to the model vector. So then at that point, CMB goes in here. And at that point, you have to build a covariance matrix for everything you have here and CMB. So as soon as something is no longer independent, it moves from here to here, and the whole game gets much, much, much harder. And supernovae, yeah, you still might think, well, they're kind of independent. What correlation could there be? But supernovae are also magnified by large-scale structure. So there is some weak correlation. And it is unclear if, it is still not entirely clear if for the LSST year 10 survey, they can be assumed as independent. For now, they are assumed as independent. But strictly speaking, they're not. It's an approximation. What do you mean the first team that, ah, well, non-informative prior. You will have to build a flat prior for your model space. Yeah. And that's a difficult topic in and itself. Uh, so things like constraints from the survey, like depth and total area, where does that show up in this analysis? Sorry, say again. So where do we see things like the depth of the survey? So does it show up in this analysis as a prior, as a constraint, anything? Right. So yeah, the question, where, where does the depth of the, of the survey show up? Um, so depth is a really tricky thing. You've, you've picked a very tricky thing. There is no answer. There is no, no easy answer to that because it shows up in, in, in several different places. So first of all, the depth of a survey shows up in what objects make it into the catalog. right? And then usually there is a lot of cuts that happen on the catalog level for various reasons, signal to noise, size, other reasons, that also preferentially exclude some things related to depth. And depth is also correlated, um, or, or these cuts are correlated with cosmological parameters, right? Because you will preferentially, um, if you cut, if you make a magnitude cut, you cut out stuff that has been strongly lensed, right? So if you have an overdensity, you will preferentially cut out stuff that's actually behind that overdensity. And that overdensity is something cosmological, right? So suddenly, by just making a magnitude cut, you have introduced a cosmological bias in your analysis. And you would have to correct for that. And now it gets very tricky. Where do you correct for that? So you can add it as an uncertainty to the error bar. Then it enters in the covariance matrix. You can model it through a nuisance parameter. But then you have to know how does it process into the observable. And then you would marginalize over that nuisance parameter. But for depth, it is really tricky and is actually one of the areas where lots of machinery is being built. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Balrog, but if you, enter, uh, uh, um, if you enter one of these large collaborations, at least DES and LSST, uh, Balrog is a way how to simulate these aspects of what, is, what biases are being introduced because of depth cuts. Yeah. Also noise. What is also shot noise? Yeah, I mean, depth has many other problems, like blending, right? Deep surveys, you suddenly have, because simply the atmosphere, you are no longer to resolve things that are, that are sufficiently close by, so you have a blending problem. Um, now, you could argue, well, shallow surveys should also have that blending problem, but it is more important for deep surveys. And, yeah, noise aspects as well. So then it enters again in the covariance matrix. Blending enters actually into uncertainty of, of, of this parameter. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Can you repeat, please, how the, is the model vector built? How it is built. So the model vector has to have the same dimension as the data vector. Okay. So you basically build, um, and, and that is up to you as, as the um, um, analyst to, to decide what goes into your data vector. So usually you decide, first of all, probes. So that's basically the order of things. Probes. Which probes do you want to include? Weak lensing, galaxy clustering, galaxy galaxy lensing, CMB lensing, galaxy clusters, etc. You first decide that. Then you decide scales to include. 
Well, actually, first you decide summary statistics. <laughs> yes. Well, let's just subsume that under summary statistics. There's a question whether you want to work in Fourier space or in, in, in real space indeed. But you have to decide which summary statistics amongst those probes, right? If you want to include weak lensing, you can include two-point functions and three-point functions and so on. Or you can just do two-point functions. So that's number one. That's number two. Number three, then, is scales and redshift. And redshift. So this defines which angular scales on the sky, theta, and redshift, which redshift bins, zi. Because this is, um, because this is a photometric survey, not every galaxy will have its own redshift, but we're going to package them. And we're going to say, OK, we have 10 redshift bins for our galaxy sample. And if you have 10 redshift bins, you get um, 55 weak lensing correlation functions, because you have 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, et cetera. So that's then 55. Um, but if you've defined all of these three, and these are dependent on your data set, right? Which scales to include. Your data tells you that to a large extent. Also, your ability to model tells you that, right? There's just some scales that our codes can't reliably model, very small scales, just too hard. Um, and the same is true for redshifts. So, but once you've determined all of that, you, have, you know your data vector very precisely, actually. Um, did that answer your question? No, what about the model? The, so then basically, these, um, so, so the data points, as you have them here, they are exactly the same ones here. But here you get them from the catalog that's been observed. Here you get it from some machinery that predicts it as a function of parameters. right? Okay. But the dimensions and the scales and everything, that is, that is the exact same in the data vector as in the model vector. And then the covariance matrix is this squared. Hello. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering over here in the other oh, side. Oh, sorry. Okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this may be in a specific question, but when you detect this no Gaussianities in the likelihood, yeah. uh, what is the standard way to solve this problem? Is using a cut in the scale before doing the? Yeah. So yeah, excellent question. Yeah, I was. Um, so I never really published that. That was just at the end of my PhD, and I was moving on. Um, but it bothered me, and there was no real standard way how to solve that. So as you said, I was looking for, well, if I confine the data vector or the model vector to certain scales, can I get away with it? But it, I didn't see any, any particular trends. It was it's simply because I worked in real space, and scales mix so much that it was not clear that, this, that, that it becomes more Gaussian when you only take large scales, for example, right? Which you could hope for, because if you take large scales, then the shear field is more Gaussian. Um, you can't go to those large scales as in the CMB, because then you don't have enough realizations. But that's not really a danger in, in weak lensing. So I did not see that kind of a trend. And um, uh, I don't think it works with just confining it to scales. There is now um, approaches to try and come up with the actual likelihood function. Like, we know that it's not a Gaussian, so what would it actually be? Given that it is, if you make the assumption that the, that the shear is distributed as a Gaussian, then the actual correct way to, to um, describe the likelihood function is an inverse Vischer. There is an analytical, there isn't a functional form for that. You can write that down. Um, but it is more complicated and it's unclear whether, the un whether the, this really makes a difference. Wishard, a multivariate version of, of uh, gamma distribution. Yes? Uh, just one, one question we were debating the other day and like to get your point of view as well. Uh, when you estimate covariance, because it's hard to estimate, you have the theoretical covariance matrices. Yeah. They're also a function of the parameters. But uh, do the Monte Carlo, we typically keep it fixed. Yes. So, and I know why we do it, because it's very hard. But to some extent, are we cheating a little bit because we keep it fixed? The, uh, you know, the like. Right. Yeah, very good point. Um, what's my pointer? Oh, here. Yeah. Um, 
we've written this down as a function of the parameters, and we've said that we have to develop a machinery to forward model the model vector as a function of these parameters. But this is also if you do if you compute it analytically, and also if you compute it from simulations, right? There is a cosmological model that enters this calculation. The simulations, they have an underlying cosmology. Somebody assumes some version of parameters. Um, if you do it analytically, you assume some parameters. So why does that not change with pi? And uh, I actually wrote a paper on this and claim it does. Um, and as you say, this opens up a huge box Pandora because this is already difficult to compute fast enough. This is almost impossible to compute fast enough. So then there was the idea, ha, huh, maybe we should develop emulators here to actually just compute it at a couple of points in parameter space and then forecast or predict the, the covariance matrix uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and then in 2012, um, there was this paper by, uh, I forgot his first name, Caron et al. I think it's 2012, 2013. Julian Caron. Oh, yeah. Um, very interesting, and I have not been able to resolve this uh, contradiction, and he claims, and it's, this, the, it's an easy argument, to, it's a, he, he very nicely makes this argument, um, that this vi if you do that, this violates the, the um, Kramer-Rao bound. Um, and that, again, ties into the assumption of a Gaussian likelihood here, which the Kramer-Rao bound only applies if that's truly a Gaussian, and it might not be, right? But if we make the assumption of a Gaussian likelihood here, and then vary this as a function of cosmological parameter, we do violate that. I have not yet seen a way around this argument. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still somewhat in favor of uh, saying that we should vary the, um, the covariance, mm -hmm. because conceptually, what does it mean? Conceptually, this, this means we have a model to predict our error bars as a function of parameters. And if those error bars change as a function of parameters that we assume, we should vary it. Right? That's, a, that's an easy argument to make. So I've not been able to reconcile these two aspects so far. Th that's a good topic for discussion, because I, I actually in favor of not varying, because exactly of this paper. And at least for the CMB, it's, it's, it's very difficult to escape. Um, yeah. There's a good topic for discussion. But you can think about doing things in ALMs, where you know things are covariance, uh, strictly Gaussian. But now here we're doing CLs, and no, CLs are not Gaussian. So when you approximate to a Gaussian, uh, it comes, uh, and when you approximate a chi-square distribution to a Gaussian, you should not make the covariance model dependent. Otherwise, you know, if you do either through ALMs or CLs, you must have the same type of information, and you don't if you vary. It's a, one, it's a very beautiful paper you should all read. So maybe you can leave that for discussions? Yep. Yes. OK, so let's thank Tim again for his lecture. Let's go for coffee. Oh, great coffee. I'm going to take this off now. Yes? Could you come back to the link for Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Good point. Um, sorry.